Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Welcome to our last but fabulous talk in Lamamia One. I'm Esther Stringer. I'm the Border Crossing UX Managing Director. And it's very dark in here all of a sudden. Um, but I am delighted to introduce to you Jenny Wood, who's Director of Strategy, Transformation, Architecture, Digital X at NatWest. Jenny and I have just been having a little chat. What she does is broad, vast, and incredibly important. And I say that not just as a customer of NatWest. Um, but she's actually trying to help an organization to keep on top of transformation, keep on top of the opportunities of technology, and ensure that they are made for good use and not just for um, advancements of tech teams, I would say, for actual customer purposes. So I'd like you to give a very, very warm welcome to Jenny um, as we introduce her for her talk. Thank you, Jenny. Um, thank you very much, and, and thanks for the, the, the full room. It's always lovely to talk to a group of people that are interested. So the format is I'll talk for about 30 minutes, and then we'll open for 10 minutes of questions. Um, you know, and so very happy to, to answer the questions that, that you would like to hear. Um, so I'm Jenny Wood. I'm, oh, I'll go back one. I'm the Director of Strategy, Transformation, and Architecture for NatWest Digital X. So what does that mean? So Digital X looks after technology, data, security, and I think Chris was on stage today with Fiona Miller, um, fraud, fin crime, and um, our operations COE. So, so a wide range of components, and I look after strategy for that area. I look after how we translate our strategy into execution, how it links back to the broader NatWest group strategy, and I look after architecture for the bank. So that's enterprise architecture as well as technical architecture as we go through. Um, I've, as you can hear, I'm not from around here, though I do live in Scotland, very passionate about Scotland, lived in Scotland for the last eight years. And um, if you heard us talking earlier, you know, Scotland's brought a whole stack of new experiences and um, opened my eyes to it. vastly different things. But I grew up in Australia and I've got a background in technology um, across telco, and financial institutions, but also little companies and big companies, um, which is, you know, always gives me a different perspective on life to, to people who've only worked big and small. Um, moved here eight years ago to, to do a role in, in RBS, um, you know, and RBS is the, the brand we love in um, Scotland, um, but it is part of the broader NatWest group. And so NatWest operates across eight countries and has over 19 million customers. We're headquartered here in Edinburgh, and many of you may know of our site out in Gogoburn, which is a fabulous campus with um, the opportunity for our 8,000 staff to come together, 8,000 Scottish staff to come together and meet and congregate and collaborate within a um, wonderful environment. Um, we also have offices across the UK, in Manchester, Birmingham, London, and we've got India Tech Hub that we, we work with. We made five billion operating profit um, before tax in 2023, so in the first nine months of 2023. So, so we, we talk at scale. And so when we talk technology, we talk at scale. And that's partly why we like to talk about technology as a business, because not only does technology do amazing things for our customers and for our colleagues, but it, it's actually large enough for us to have to think about how we choose what we do and making sure we do it in the most effective and efficient ways as we come through. A um, little bit of scale, we're the second largest mortgage lender in the UK. and We process 40% of um, payment flows in the UK daily. And so, you know, we, we do a huge amount of things that help ordinary people in the UK connect together and do the things that they want to do and enable them to live their lives the way that they want to. We cover retail, commercial, and institutional, and private banking. We've got seven brands, and our oldest brand dates back to the 1650s. The RBS brand dates back to the early 1700s. So we've got a lot of heritage in what we do and how we do it and how we think about it, which well predates the advent of technology. Technology as we know it. You could argue the evolution of technology starting from from older times. Um, for technology, we have 2,800 applications, um, 45,000 distributed servers, um, of which about 80, 85% are virtualized. Um, 
88% of our customer needs are met digitally. So when you think about what we call digital X at the heart of a relationship bank, you know, we basically make, you know, 88% of our customers deal with this in a way that's serviced by the technology that we provide. And, and digital X, which is the area I'm a part of, has over 35,000 colleagues. So we, we have to think about that in a scale of a business because even though we exist within that West, we're still large in terms of what we do. Um, one of the things we're very proud of is the work we do across the innovation ecosystem, the fintech ecosystem, both here in Scotland um, and in the broader um, UK. So when we think about running technology in big banks, you know, it, it may feel like you know, big banks have huge amounts of resources, they've got big technology teams, they've got legacy technology, new technology. One of the things when you work in technology in a big bank is diversity is everywhere and you have the opportunity to, to do that type of, do whatever type of work you want to do. But there is old and there is, is new. But we need to think about technology of business and one of the things we have to think about is how we get faster at doing what we need to do. The cycles of change have just got in faster and faster every year. You know, you take a look at the new evolution, and we used to talk about how Uber came through and how we had um, Amazon and all of those shifts. And you take a look at the recent one with Gen AI, which pretty much went from still in theoretical mode, lots of techies knew about it, to suddenly public in about three months from the, the first start of the real noise to the, the, the big noise. The cycles of change and the cycles of evolution of innovation that we sit within are getting faster and faster. And we need to think about how we respond and react in the right way, which is responsible for our customers, but actually keeps us at the edge of what we need to do for them in a way that gives them what they need to do, as well as our colleagues. Because, you know, when you th think about things even like Gen AI, you know, one of the key applications is to help engineers code better, to help engineers get access to things they didn't. And you then have the other side of it, which is how do you do that in a way that's, that's responsible? Um, technology in big banks is there to enable the business. You know, we're not a digital startup. Not every person around the table is a technologist who's grown from a technology, a business idea that was instantiated in technology. You know, it, it's an old idea. I talked about it being as old as 1600. Um, you know, and we're now, we've built technology up to support it. And we've got to recognise when we think about our technology as a business that, that we're here to support our customers and our colleagues and our role is to give them the tools and capabilities to deliver value. But our business is not technology. Our business isn't only the things that we can do digitally. It's the way we can help vulnerable customers. It's the way we help our, custom, our everyday customers. There are so many things we do that actually won't ever be digitised, and we have to be conscious of that. We have to balance those two. We have to digitise where it's right, we have to enable technology where it's right, and we have to recognise that there are sometimes moments that matter that actually technology is not the right answer, particularly in a business like ours. And we have to be cost-led in technology. Our business areas are value-driven, but we actually have to be cognisant of cost. Our business people will keep us, and you know, I use the term technology in the business, but, but the people facing out to our customers will keep us focused on the things that are most important for our customers. We have to make sure that we're not running after every single idea and doing it in a way that's actually not giving value and at a cost that we can afford. There are so many different opportunities that we could follow, but we have to get that balance right between the cost, not just financial cost, but the agility cost of doing things in a way that gives us that balance. So when we think about how we run technology, not how we deliver technology, not how we engineer it, but how we run technology as a business, th these are the three things that we're, we're focused on as we run through. It, we don't live just in an organisation by ourselves. You know, I'd love to say that, you know, all I have to do is look inwards and I can do my job and that makes it easy. You know, we, we live in a world where everything around us is changing. We saw the latest announcements on NI changes, which change the cash that people have available to them, change some of the questions that they're asking about their financial needs. Um, we know that we're in a position where um, interest rates and um, the cost of contracts and 
salary growth has been phenomenal over the last couple of years. And in fact, someone gave me a stat, which I can't attribute, but I'll, I'll re-quote on the, the context that you might need to check it. You know, that effectively we've seen the greatest rate of interest rate rises, the greatest economic growth period in 40 years. Um, you know, many people haven't lived this before. And so when you think about the way people are acting or the information customers want, the way our colleagues are feeling, the way we need to use technology to support that, that's vastly different to what it was three years ago during COVID when we were just worried about enabling people to work at home and making sure that everyone had what they needed to get through that period. Um, so the macro and microeconomic environments are vastly different now to what they were three years ago. And with banks, if you lift it up, you know, that means our focus on return on tangible equity and our focus on um, our RWAs and net interest rate margins as we see a crunch between some of the, the factors out there makes it different for us in terms of what we're thinking about in terms of cost versus growth as we come through, which actually means we either have less to spend or we have to be smarter about how we spend it and we have to make sure we're investing in our people and our talent at the right ways, but our suppliers, our partners actually need more from us as well during this period and so it gives us a very different set of equations that we, we manage within. The regulatory environment, you know, and I always like to think of regulation as something that keeps us honest and something that keeps us focused on customers and is there to ensure that we're doing the best thing that we can do for our customers at every point in time, because that's really what regulation is. It's that, that check to say, you're doing the best thing you can. And so consumer duty is all about us making sure we're doing the right thing by our customers. Um, you know, the regulations that we have around making sure we manage our third party risk is really about making sure we're there for our customers. And so for me, regulation's an enabler to the outcomes we're after. Um, and, but what it does do is it can cause us to have to do things that we might not otherwise choose to do. And so we need to make sure that we're focused on delivering under the regulations that we have and in the time frame that we're asked to meet the regulations. And so that's another factor that we play in. Um, lots of competition, digital banks, niche banks, um, people who can get one feature out far quicker, who aren't subject to the same regulations that we are, but people who can react in the market faster than us are people are uh, something that we need to watch and we need to consider and we need to partner with. And so you'll have seen us doing work around Rooster Money to make sure that we're got the right partnerships going and you know, we bought Rooster Money to, to give us support in the youth market for something we couldn't do internally at the pace we wanted to, so we, we acquired. Cushion's another one in pensions, which is another conversation. And so for us, that external market doesn't just come in how we build technology, but it might come in how we acquire technology too. Um, sustainability is key. I love AI and I've got a quote later, but you know, con compute, consumption, the cost of technology doesn't just come in the money we spend on the people who are going to build it and the contracts that underpin it. It comes in the compute, the electricity, the way we've got the cycles running and those sorts of things. And so sustainability is really key. As we make models more available to our modelers so that they can make better decisions for our customers, they use more compute, which drives our cost of technology up. And so all of these factors come into us thinking about what we do. Um, and the last one is around balancing the tensions, which is all of these things come together and say, you know, how do we think about the, the value we create and choosing to do the right things as we head towards um, you know, the thing that we need to do, which is deliver to customers and colleagues and to our shareholders. So internally, you know, we've got everyone who wants to do everything. You know, just before I came in, I had 17 different people pinging me about someone who's published that they're doing internally something on AI. You know, and everyone's going, does anyone know who's doing this? How do we know who's driving that conversation? Is it in line with this other conversation? Is it, are we all heading in the same direction? Are we going to do it with the same suppliers? Are we not doing it with the same suppliers? Um, our business demand is ever there. And as we live in a more technological world where everyone can see what other people are doing, that demand only grows. We could have budgets well in excess of double, triple what we've got and we could still spend it all. Whether we could spend it effectively on delivering value is another question, but we've got the demand to do far more than we do, which is why choosing is the right thing to do, and how we prioritise, particularly where we put our investment in technology, is really important. You know, we can't do it all ourselves, and so it is about partners and how we manage the relationships with our partners. During COVID, it was very important to us that we partnered with them to work out how they were going as well as how we were going during that period because of the fact that 
everyone was struggling. We needed to make sure that we all banded together to make that come through. Yeah? Same as we see economic environment changes. We, we need to understand how our partners and suppliers are working with us. And we see costs going up, which means that we need to then manage how we cope with those increased costs. Operational resilience and security. And if you saw Chris talk about security earlier, you know, it's something we're passionate about, but also kept making sure that our services are available and we do what we said we'd do. Um, and operational res resilience sometimes comes at a cost, a tactical cost. The strategic cost of operational resilience is you don't get upset customers, you don't get phone calls, you don't get um, a poor customer experience and customers can do what they want to do. But it may feel at the time like some of the things you have to build in to make that resilience happen are costs that you may not want to have at that particular point in time. And, and the last one, and this is where I love, you know, Edinburgh, Scotland, um, you know, it's talent and supply versus demand. And for us, one of our key focus areas is ensuring we've got the right talented engineering and technology staff who feel enabled to do what they need to do um, to deliver to our customers. And so a, key, a big part of my job under the strategy is how do we help that workforce grow and how do we make sure we've got the right diversity, the right talent, the right tools for them. So when we get the right people in, they feel like the organisation's there for them. Take a slight tangent here to innovation. And so, you know, I don't need to tell many people in this room that, that the rate of innovation is increasing. And we spoke about this, this earlier. And um, we spoke about the fact that Gen AI, you know, has just come through and has rapidly changed plans that were even in place 12 to 24 months ago, you know, because of the fact that there are capabilities that we hadn't thought we would have to build into the normal planning. Everyone was watching it, but suddenly it's become the big thing. It's the big thing that everyone wants to make an announcement about. Um, and in those ways, you know, we've got to be able to react as an organisation. We've got to be able to re-pivot investment. We've got to make sure we've got the people with the skills to actually do the work that we've been asked to do and make sure we've got the partners in place to understand. You know, and for us, you know, when you think about some of the innovation you're seeing come through, it comes through not just in how we use it, but it's how all our vendors and our suppliers use it. You know, people are now building AI and modelling into the products they have. We've got a lot of regulation around model, model risk that we need to cover as a bank and data <coughs> ethics. And we've got very strict standards ourselves. And so it goes beyond us understanding what we're doing, but also understanding what all the people we work with are doing and how they're applying some of that innovation. But it's getting faster and faster. And it's only got faster since, you know, you can talk about the agricultural revolution, you can talk about the industrial revolution, you can talk about the technological re revolution. You know, we're now in a, a knowledge revolution, data revolution. Um, that the, 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 the cycle times are just getting faster and our need to react is just getting faster as we go through. Um, and, you know, that means that we always, as a part of our business, have, a, have, have one eye on what we're doing now, but we have one eye on the horizon. And the horizon can be very different depending on where you're looking to see um, the application. And some of it will come from financial services and some of it will come from companies like us. Some of it will come from companies that don't look anything like us. And our job is to actually try and balance between the two what we see coming from companies like us and what we see out there. And so at the moment, we're looking at generative AI, we're looking at edge computing, we're looking at um, how we can use DLT. DLT is one of those technologies that hyped for a while, it sort of came back down, and now we're seeing it come back in as we start talking about um, digital um, assets and digital currencies and um, the Bank of England's work around that space. And so we'll see some more on DLT. Um, you know, what we do with natural language programming, um, natural language understanding. So quantum is another one, you know, that we're, we're watching very closely. You know, if quantum takes the same jump as AI has taken, you know, that changes the whole world in terms of speed of compute for, for models, for security, for a whole raft of things. And so it's one that we watch very closely. No code, low code. My, my, my franchises and functions want to be able to do their own work. They want to be able to have access to their own data. And so that's one we watch as well. You know, you don't want your company running on Excel, but you also don't want your company having to come back centrally to do everything it needs to do. 
Um, not that we use Excel as a low-code tool, but everyone uses Excel for something. Um, you know, whether you're using Power BI, whether you're using Tableau, whether you're using Dynamics and any of those things, you know, one of the big things we have to watch is having just enough capability open for, uh, available for our business teams to, to democratise the data that we have. Um, and cloud, you know, I saw a great article about cloud and the, the, the unit cost of cloud and, you know, everyone I talk to, I'm a on the Technology Business Management Council, and everyone I talk to loves cloud for its engineering capabilities. We're all a little bit apprehensive about the security capabilities that we put over it, not cloud, but, but that we can make sure that we're doing to have our engineers protect the things that they need to. But then when you come to cost is another conversation. And if we don't architect and design our applications the right way, you know, I talk about the fact we've got a finite amount we spend on technology. It's a lot, don't get me wrong. We've got a huge amount of money that that organisations spend on technology. But if we put it all into running our cloud compute, then actually we're not putting it somewhere else. And that's why we need to manage and monitor and understand how we're doing that. Um, and this is my stat on AI, which is that the AI industry could consume as much energy as a country the size of the Netherlands by 2027. So you think about goals around sustainability, you think about goals around compute, around cost, and you know, all of the impacts of that. And for us, it's around how we think about managing that and balancing it through. Because you want to do it. Don't get me wrong. We want to do it, but we need to do it in a way that manages it through. Um, so for us, um, we are a relationship bank in a digital world. Um, I talked about this. And when we talk about digital eggs, we talk about engineering, protecting, and operating, because they're all verbs and they're the things that we do. But we need to pull together a whole stack of things to actually make sure that technology is managed as a business. And so we think about it in terms of one bank, which is how do we work together as one bank to do things once, if we can? Or how do we manage the flow of our work in the business to do it the right way and not end up with needless duplication? Um, that means we need to have an architecture that's clear, that's understandable, that's practical. You know, it has to not just exist on a PowerPoint sheet that every engineer puts in their drawer. It has to be something that is a bank we live towards. Um, and we're doing some more work around making sure that happens. It comes around speed. You know, we know that if people can't rely on us to do the technology work they need to do fast, they'll go and do it themselves or they'll go and pay someone else to do it. And as soon as we start doing that, we actually start fragmenting our agility because of the fact that the data doesn't connect. And you think about the world we're in, where if you can't connect your data, you can't use AI. You can't do the analytics you need to do. And so it's all for us about actually being able to connect the data back together in a way that gives us what we need. Doesn't mean we don't use third parties, but we have to find a way of bringing that back together. Scale. I everything we do is about scale. 35,000 people, 2,500 apps, 45,000 servers. You know, we have to be able to do what we do at scale. 40% of the payments within the UK, it has to scale, it has to perform. It has to be able to do the things we need to do and it has to do it safely and securely and reliably for us. Um, you know, which brings us into the, the protect conversation and it has to do it in a way that we can meet our goals uh, of carbon zero um, as we go forward. And for our people, we have to be a great place to work. We have to be somewhere that gives them fulfilling conversations, growth for their careers and the ability to actually learn new things and get their hands on new things when they come through. And so we work to pull all of those levers at once to drive the way we work in technology um, across NatWest as a business. One of the big things we're driving at at the moment is learning and experimentation. And so we've had the goal for the last three or four years of, of learning culture but we've actually now started introducing the capability for our teams to start doing small sharp experiments on the things that will make a difference and what they will want to see changed and how they think about that. Um, so how do we make this happen? Um, and I'll just do a couple more and then we'll open for questions. So how do we make this happen? So it's all about having the right resources come in. So partners, people, tools, the, the things that we need to have access to the, the capabilities that are going to help us create it. Um, we then need to do it in the right way. So agile release trains, um, DevOps methodology, testing and feedback. It's the cycles of learning that you bring through that will make a fundamental difference. And it's not just technology doing it, it's as a bank. 
So several years ago, we turned into journeys. So we took all of our customer facing franchises and our technology teams and we made a shift into to value streams of journeys. And we need to work through those value streams and test and learn as we go through. And the final thing is making sure that we've adapted and adjusted as we go through. We're very clear on the results we want to deliver and those results are customer results and they frame the work that our teams do. But it is that cycle of experimentation and learning that actually allows us to know when we're going off path. But to do that, we have to have data, we have to have metrics, and we have to understand what they're telling us as we go through. Um, so, you know, we set our strategy, we set the guardrails for our teams. This is what you can do. You can't go and buy something we've already got one of. You can't go put it on your corporate credit card. Not that people do that either. Um, this is the target architecture we want you to work within. You know, you can deviate, but come and talk to us before you deviate. So if you're working in the architecture, fabulous, go do it. If you're working outside the architecture, come and talk to us. Doesn't mean the architecture's right, but it's just a point of conversation as we go through. Setting governance and standards and the controls that we put over it. So if I sort of come back to, to what we're talking about. So, so technology is fabulous. It enables every single part of our lives. But everything we do in technology is not all about the technology. We have to think about how we run technology as a business. And there's whole groups of people who sit behind the engineers and the, the, the people who are on the front end of how we deliver technology, thinking about how we make sure that we've got the right things in place to run the business that is technology and we're doing the right things with it because otherwise we end up delivering lots of things that aren't valuable to our customers or our colleagues or we end up being too slow to react because we're not doing the right things. We need to think long term, we need to prioritise the short term because speed of change is coming through. We need to understand some of the opportunities but also some of the risks of not being um, there when it is. So if we aren't in AI, What's the consequence to us as an organisation? If we don't shut something else down, finite set of money, every five million pounds I spend on AI or every million pounds I spend on AI is a million I can't spend somewhere else that someone thought they were going to get. So those choices we need to make really clear. Um, and we need to listen and adapt because the world's not static. And the final thing we ask of our engineers is to be commercial. You know, shut down that test environment, understand the consumption, understand what you're creating because we can't do it reactively, we've actually got to build it into everything we do. And so think about green coding, think about how you put your tech out there and think about what you're creating for your customers to use because it's got to be sustainable for them as well in the environment they're a part of. So I'll pause there and open for questions. But what I really wanted to just talk about today was what we think about when we run technology as a business across NatWest. Thank you very much, Jenny. Brilliant talk, really, really interesting to think about how you actually do balance those and tensions between the business and also the technology departments. We've got some microphones going around, so if you could put your hand up if you have a question for Jenny. Um, if it's all right, I would quite like to kick off if that's all right. Just because I'm really, really interested um, in the idea of the, not just the, the environmental impact, but as you say, the cost of compute power. And how do you balance that in terms of working out whether uh, cutting edge technology, you know, last year we were all talking about metaverse, which is extraordinary yep. deficit to the environment, or AI, which maybe, how do you balance that kind of risk reward to the planet, to the organization, because obviously you maybe can't calculate what the compute cost will be. How do you manage that internally? Yeah, so, so we actually do track very heavily that the carbon impact we have as an organisation and we are committed to our, the targets that we've put out um, as part of COP26, but we continue to, to focus on those every year. So we give our teams tools to measure not just the cost of their applications, but also the carbon footprint of their applications. And so they know that their legacy server that's running in a data centre consuming this much electricity actually costs them X. We work very closely with our compute partners on how we can then represent the cost of their compute. We know that the models increase compute. And we're having this conversation internally about how do you balance the 
benefit from the model with the cost of compute and the impact on the environment, but actually also make sure that people aren't just randomly running models. You know, it's back to, you know, I'll show my age here, it's back to the days when compute was scarce, where you had to schedule your job to run, where you, you couldn't actually just go randomly using processing power because you wanted to query something. So we're trying to instill a conversation in our business people about the value of what they're trying to do and do they re actually really need to run another cycle to get the answer or do they know the answer and we're just really, you know, running around the edges. But it's something we're not there with and the AI conversation is one that we're monitoring and we're measuring. What we will do is we'll be very transparent and we'll have the measures in place and the monitoring in place so that it doesn't run away from us. And that's been very important with cloud because people forget to turn stuff off. Mm -hmm. People run stuff over the weekend and it just runs away. And so, you know, that triumvirate of consumption, cost and impact on the environment is, is how we do it. But we haven't got it right and it's still emerging, but we're trialling some stuff that, that gives those, um, that transparency to the person who's making the choice. Lovely, thank you. I guess that's all you can do at this stage is empower people to make decisions within the context of the information they have. Yep. Lovely. Have we got any questions from the floor? Anyone? We've got Jasper. Thank you. Hi, Alan Anderson. Um, banks generally have a large committed legacy spend every year. Mm. Can't get away from it, or you challenge to get away from it. And that obviously inhibits how much you can invest. How do you manage to balance that out and make your priorities? Yeah. Um, it's a debate. It's a debate we have every year, which is how do we how do we get more out of our regulatory and our remediation um, bucket into the the new capability bucket. Um, we, we do it in a couple of ways. One of which is we try and make sure that wherever possible we keep currency and remediation actually active while we're doing new stuff. So it's relatively easy where you've got a forward book of work on a set of technology. Where it starts getting harder is where you've got legacy technology that no one touches but it just works. And they don't tend to be your big things because everyone changes the big things. They tend to be the little things that you want to go and you know, no one really can cost justify um, taking them out or, or moving them. And so we try and make sure we're doing the right things in that space to keep it current, to keep it at, out of end of life, to keep it... Um, where it needs to be, but but you will always have spend in that space, whether it's keep showing your road money or, or those sorts of things. That the piece that causes the most interest is actually the regulatory spend. You know, we, we have to comply with regulations, we have to comply with Basel three, we'll have to comply with the Ops Resilience regu regulations. Um, and whilst, you know, there are a couple of different ways of complying with those, you can execute for compliance and do your bare minimum spend to meet compliance. Or actually, you can use them to turn the organisation around and, and think differently. And with things like our payment spend, we've actually tried to use the ISO regulatory work to, to give us what we need going forward in it. But it's a tension that no bank has got right. And I was actually talking to someone from another bank this morning about it. You know, and, and every bank has the same conversation. And really, I think what it comes down to is how we give our engineers the tools to design and engineer in a way that gives them the space to actually take care of the code and take care of the applications that they've got without relying directly on someone to say, here is a pound to do that. Um, but we're, we're not quite there yet with that. Um, if you've got any ideas, I'd love to hear them afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Thank you. Any more from the floor? One at the back there. I'm from NatWest myself, Jenny M. Kavita. I saw a slide where you showed a seed innovation pipeline. Yep. Could you tell us about it? Yeah, uh, so, so we, we have a certain amount of money we set aside for seed innovation where I talked about experimentation. You know, experimentation we're asking people to do without investment in technology. The, the systems thinker in me really likes the fact that people think about what they're doing and design it before they, they start building it. But um, our seed innovation funding is where if we've got a good idea that needs a little bit of investment to trial something that is truly innovative to the company, we'll make that available to you. Small amounts of money in our terms, for, for, for some companies it's big amounts of money, but it's, it's in the tens of thousands we make available. 
Um, and it really is for something that probably wouldn't get th investment through the normal cycles. It has to be really embryonic, but it's something we might try. So, so my team's doing some work with um, the, our people team on technology skills um, with some innovative suppliers on perhaps how we can use our mining of technology skills and what we know about um, the, the skills with the work that we've got in terms of job families and training to better generate pathways for our people to, to grow. Um, and there's some really nice stuff around AI that can help us do that. But, you know, it's a small little piece of work. It's something we're doing on the side. But, you know, if it works, then we'll come back into the standard investment funds to do it. Or we might go, we get a third party to do something like that for us in the broader space. But, you know, we've probably got 35 ideas that have gone through the SICK committee in the last six months. One of my staff always says to me when I delegate that one to them that that's the one they want to come back to and they've asked for a permanent delegation. I go, no, I enjoy that one. Um, so I'll do that one. Lovely. Thank you. Great question. And just down the front here. Oh, sorry, do you mind if we just get the microphone to you? Thank you. Thank you so much. Hopefully, yeah. Did it work? Working? Yeah. 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 Um, um, this uh, culture of experimentation, did you find that after you kind of got to a certain point, it just almost had a, a life of its own and it became almost like... Just a new way of doing things. It's my biggest desire and my biggest fear. Um, you know, we are seeing a huge number of people doing experiments on things that they want to make different. We, we do find they're a little bit self-fulfilling still. We're not quite at the point where our experiments are get setting out to disprove my hypothesis. We're still at the point where people are setting their hypotheses in a way that they want to prove them. And so we haven't quite broken that let's get it right every time. We're not seeing enough of them fail, I'd say. You know, our seed innovation committee, we do see failure. We see, you know, we're probably only expecting one out of ten to go through to anything that we're likely to use, if that. But our experimentation, we're still getting our people comfortable with the fact that it's not just a way of gathering data and using scientific method to prove the thing you always knew. Um, but the, the vocab's changed in the last 12 months across the company. And you know, even some strategy work I'm working on at the moment at a more senior level, we're talking about the hypotheses that we want to prove that would make a difference towards us achieving an outcome or the hypotheses that we want to disprove um, in that space. But it, it does change that learning conversation. Um, one of the things we struggled with when we first brought learning organisation out was people equate learning to training just like they, expect, they sort of equate experimentation to, I want to change somebody else's world or things like that. And so we had to do a lot of work to get learning equal to performance. So, so you learn for performance, you get knowledge to help your performance and you should measure and work out where you want to grow. You know, just training without thinking that you're going to, to apply it in some way just isn't enough. Same with experimentation, you know, we're in that early cycle of, you know, Let's pick the big things and let's not let's work out what you can change, not the pet project that you you do now just want to go and whack on somebody's desk and say, hey, here's the data that says my pet project's right. But we're getting there. And, and the, the vocab's changed dramatically, which is always the start of those cultural journeys. Wonderful thing. There must be quite a challenge to because we are we do like to be validated in our thinking, don't we, as human beings? So <laughs> we, we do and you know, it's the scarcity versus the growth mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think money's scarce, if you think resources are scarce and you have to validate it, you're, you're down here trying to validate what you want. If you actually can make that shift to, to a growth mindset, you actually think very differently about those things. And so, so that's actually one of the hardest things in the shift that we're trying to do, which is the, the whilst it might feel like you're not getting what you want, you know, you're a part of a big organisation that, that has opportunities and perhaps there are different ways of, of solving the same problem. And if you haven't got it, you know, a bit like the AI one, we had to take money off somebody to give it to AI because money doesn't, as much as we all wish, it doesn't grow on trees. Um, and so to do that, you know, someone had to stop something. And so it's as important when you do things like experimentation to know what you're going to stop and why you're going to stop it as it is the things that you're going to go ahead on. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Have we got one more question from the floor? 
Uh, the gentleman here, the, 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 uh, the mic's coming from the other side, just to confuse you. Hi there. Um, I'm just wondering, you've I've got a lot of change happening, which is great. How do you keep your users on board and bring them along with you with all the change that's happening? Oh, the, the end conversation. And that's really hard. We have a lot of debate on that topic. And it's really interesting. I go, hey, you could, you could, if you get your DevOps right, if you can get your Agile stuff right, if you can get the way you do your work right, you could do a drop every week. And they go, no. I can't imagine it. But you think about it, you know, do you actually sometimes stop and think when your apps update? In fact, you've got auto update on, so you probably don't know how often they update. But it is one of those things where that balance between distributing a change that's going to impact customers or colleagues and actually distributing a change are two different things. You know, I learned in the pharmaceutical industry at one point, um, you know, th they separate deployment and, in fact, not even deployment, they separate build, deployment, and then advertising. And so we don't think about change that way. We think about it being tightly coupled together and so one of the things we have to work to do is help our engineers build and design in a way that separates the three, because you could deploy without switching it on. We know that. It's simple, simple engineering. You could actually deploy without advertising it. You know, beta functionality, who stumbled across something that was in an app that they didn't know was there, and then suddenly went, oh, I really like that. And then suddenly it goes viral and everyone's using it before they can advertise it. Um, but separating those three things out is really, really important. But the other thing comes to how you design it and how you prepare for it. And you know, if you do everything big bang, then it feels really big. If you perhaps do some tweaks along the way that bring you closer to where you want to get to in the end, then people don't notice as much. And, and it is all about that. And we get it wrong sometimes and we get it right at other times. But, but it does actually start from the way we engineer, design and architect. Um, and tightly coupled architectures limit, limit your ability to do that. So one of the challenges I've got for my boss at the moment is how do I make the architecture looser? Mm, that's, that's tough one. Great question, though, because having just updated my iOS, um, I am most displeased with the changes, even though I'm sure they will be much better for me. People don't <laughs> like change. Um, well, if you could join me in thanking Jenny one more time. Absolutely wonderful.